清达的身体，为此发挥及一切众生，心转妙法轮，教导我们如何了生脱死，离苦得乐，速证。Well, the Sangha, with great virtue, out of compassion, for the sake of this assembly and all living beings, please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us. How to bring and attain bliss and understand this and quickly realize numbers. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato. Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Ammo Saranto Sucero Ye Orahuri Samyao Sanputoshi. Namo Sadanto Suche Doye Erahadi Samyang San Putoshi Ushang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Chen Wan Che Nan Sao Yu Wo Jin Chen Wan De Shou Chi Yan Che Ru Lai Chen Shi Yi Give you a line, you give it back. Supreme and wondrous Dharma. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, rarely is encountered, even in a million eons, even in a billion eons. But now we see and hear it, and now we see and hear and accept it reverently, accept it reverently. May we truly understand, may we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning, the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master and Dharma friends, welcome to our sutra lecture tonight. This is. July fifteenth. It's a Saturday night. We're here in Berkeley, California, and we're explaining the Flower Garland Sutra. This is the Ten Grounds chapter, the Dashabumi chapter. We're on ground number eight. We've come all that way, so let's get going by chanting the name of the Sutra and the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, which you'll find on the front cover of your Sutra booklet. Namo Da Fang Guang Fu Hua Yen Ji Hua Yen Hai Hui Fu Pu Sa Namo Da Fang Guang Fu Hua Yen Ji Hua Yen Hai Hui Fu Pu Sa Namo Da Fang Guang Fu Hua Yen Ji Hua Yen Hai Hui Ho Pu Sa Namo Da Fang Guang Fu Hua Yen Ji Hua Yen Hai Hui Ho Pu Sa Namo Da Fang Guang Fu Hua Yen Ji Hua Yen Hai Hui Po Pu Sa Namo Da Fang Guang Fu Hua Yen Ji Hua Yen Hai Hui Po Pu Sa 
mô đà phang quang phu hoa yên gì hoa yên hai huế phổ thủ sa Please turn to page 8 and page 9 in your books. We're down at the bottom, the last paragraph on both the Chinese and the English side. Okay, everybody know our method, our technique. We start by reciting the Chinese together. I give you a line, you give it back. Then we move over to the English, and we do that in unison. Okay, here we go. Fuzi, Pusa Changjo Tsi Ren, Chishi De Ru. Di 必知佛所不能及所不能及李珠宣正啊宣正即灭现前即灭现前 Okay, over to the right now, page 9 at the bottom. Ready? Let's read it together. Disciples of the Buddha, when the Bodhisattva achieves this patience, he immediately enters the eighth ground, that of stability. He becomes a bodhisattva of profound practice. He is hard to know, has no discriminations, is free from all characteristics, all thought, and all attachments. He is limitless and boundless, and no sound hearers or pracheka buddhas can match him. He leaves behind all clamor and dispute, and a state of still quiescence appears before him. Okay. Eighth ground, Bodhisattva, who is uh, reaching this um, place in his practice or her practice that is considered to be the big turning point. Uh, the first one being the Bodhicitta, the Bodhi resolve that the Bodhisattva made who knows how long ago before he or she set out on this path. This is the next big turning point. So what we're going to see tonight, we're... We're already into the, we're past the preamble. We're now into the actual uh, substance of this, this um, series of instructions called the eighth stage, the eighth grade, the eighth ground. So what's going on is the Bodhisattva's mind is changing, um, actually transforming. And what is doing it is the, 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 what's happening here is we're seeing the effects of what are called dharmas, capital D, that is to say, forms that Buddhas transmit. We're seeing the effect of that on a human being, particularly the mind. It's dramatic. Things really change. And it's not only changing here in the eighth ground, it's been changing subtly all along. You, mm, somebody who wants a really good PhD topic could go through the Avatamsaka Sutra and make a list of all the different places where the Sutra describes a mental change, an emotional change, a psychic change. Uh, what would be an example of an emotional change? Uh, on the first ground, the Bodhisattva leaves all fear behind. 
becomes absolutely free of fear. And it specifies what they are. There's an example. Um, this is a profound um, mental uh, transformation, not just thinking differently, but actually physically something changes. Um, let's clock some of the earlier ones. There was a, f- a place between the ten practices, uh, between the ten transferences and the ten grounds where the bodhisattva entered the dhyanas. And what happens then? Your breathing stops. What happens next? Your heartbeat stops. And you don't die. It's a perfectly, quote, natural response of the body to these practices. Interesting, huh? So let's just see when in normal, in our everyday culture, something like that might happen. Well, when you go to the doctor. Okay, if you go to the doctor, let's say particularly a Chinese doctor. Uh, I don't know if anybody, probably most of us here have had that experience. I don't know if everybody who will be listening online uh, will have had that experience. But uh, when you go to a Chinese doctor, for example, they uh, typically, if they're maybe, let's say, an acupuncturist, they go in and the first thing they do is they look at you, a skillful doctor will smell your smell, look at your color, ask you to stick out your tongue, then take your pulse. And by sensitive training of the fingertips, they can feel not just kind of the pulse that we feel, they can feel numbers of pulses, heart meridian pulse, liver, kidneys, gallbladder, spleen. And by judging, they go, oh, that feels kind of ropey. Oh, that feels kind of stiff. Oh, that feels really sluggish. They'll say, oh, you need to adjust here and here and here. They take these very slender needles, put them in the right places, and adjust your body. You change. Because you change the pulse of the meridians, your organs change. They either speed up or they slow down. They get what are called tonified or sedated. What happens? Your symptoms go away. Your tension goes away, for example. Your habits can go away. Things like that. So when you go to a typical Chinese doctor, for example, things change because of what they do. They apply a form or a technique or an intervention and things change. Exactly what's going on here in the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Bodhisattva is being his own Dharma doctor, so to speak, and is applying these things called uh, fa, fa man, sometimes, Dharma methods, techniques. What would be one? Sitting in full lotus. There you go. There's a physical intervention, right? You're crossing your legs, taking your senses, and instead of allowing them to freely run out and interact with sights and sounds and smells, etc., you do what's called Wei Guang, you reflect, you bring your senses back in, and sights are still there, but you're not intending, you're not directing your eyes out into the stream. Sounds are still there, but you're not intently listening to discriminate high sounds, low pitch, pleasant sounds, coarse sounds, etc. So that's an intervention. What happens bit by bit is that energy stays with you, and oh my goodness, you know, your body warms up, for example. Bit by bit by bit, things change, we get to the eighth ground, and this bodhisattva is now able to influence his or her mental processes in a profound way. Let's see. Okay, kind of get the context of what what could happen here. I'm preparing us, talking in advance about a way to interpret what we're going to be hearing tonight. Okay. This Bodhisattva has done this practice now. He's got a patience. (laughs) I got a patience. Oh, we don't think of patience as a thing. Here it is. There are three in particular. This is the third one and the hardest one to master. And what is a patience? A patience could be an absence of of motion. No movement. Why? Because you can wait. 
What does patience do? Patience waits. It just hangs on and it waits. It doesn't react. Okay? It endures. Right? Is it I we're not doing politics, so I won't mention her name, but she persisted. Right? A famous moment in our political system recently when a a female senator persisted and it just because it stood out as a method. It just came into immediately came into the mainstream parlance. Wow, look, that's what you do in the face of injustice or oppression. You persist. You keep asking. You keep standing. You don't move. Okay? Bodhisattva did it. He accomplished this patience. What is it? It's Wu Sheng Fa Ren. Wu Sheng Fa Ren. That's the way to say it. Wu Sheng Fa Ren. Patience when dharmas no longer arise. I like that translation because it goes bump up, bump up, bump up, bump up, bump up, bump up, bump up. One, two, three, one. It's a kind of a jig rhythm, right? One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. So we've heard it translated as the non produced Dharma patience, which is not English. That's just, that's Chinese word order with English words on top. So what is patience when dharmas no longer arise other than jig rhythm? It's a state where you, because of your meditation, because of your samadhi, understand how our faithful carnations right here have always been those carnations. They've always been just that way, never changing as I perceive them, the interaction between my eyes and those yellow chlorophyll structures. And at the same time, they come and go in an eye blink. They're gone. They wilt and they return. They recycle. All of the elements, the conditions there come into being, stay, wilt, vanish, and return. But there's another level of perception where they're always there. They don't move. Total contradiction, total nonsense on the point of, on, from the point of view of linear discussion, but that's what's going on. The Bodhisattva sees them both and doesn't go crazy. He's patient when dharmas no longer go through everything they've gone through according to common sense from the start. Right? So impermanence is no longer impermanent. No self is no longer no self. Okay? Right? There's anicca and dukkha, all the different seals of dharmas that are considered to be immutable. Right? There's uh, the emptiness of dharmas, the fact that they have no self-nature. Right? That, that's shunya, that aspect. They're totally empty and they're always there. They don't move. And the bodhisattva makes sense of that so he doesn't react. And yet he's still learning. That's, that's key. This bodhisattva is a, still a student here because he's going to take this knowledge and use it immediately to help people. Okay? So I'm just riffing on what this patience could be because you have to take a running leap. you got to get a running start to make sense of this. This is a, not a beginner's state. But I wonder how many of you sitting right here in front of your computers listening in, how many of you have ever mm, had time behave erratically? Let's say you were mm, had a fever. Maybe you caught the flu. And it was that kind of flu that puts your temperature up to 100 degrees or 101. Or so. And time, time changes. I recall one of my earliest, earliest memories as a baby. I don't remember how young I was, but I remember um, lying in bed with a fever and looking up at a, um, a window shade, one of the old kind of what were they? They were made of a kind of paper that was kind of oilcloth paper with texture in it. And they had those, they were on a wooden roller with those little aluminum uh, sp spring-loaded, you know, pushers so that they would hold up. And you pull it down and it would go rump, 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 rump. 
And down at the bottom, if you went, boom, it would go flap, 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 go right back up. You know the ones I mean? They were like, and, and I remember staring at it. It was down. It was a s- summer day, hot, and there was a fly trying to get out. And I remember watching the fly and imagining that I was the fly and what was that consciousness. And then I just, what's the difference between me and lying here in bed sick and that fly? And I just have this strong impression of seeing the color of the, the blind, the window blind, and the fly buzzing, trying to get out and going the wrong direction and catching itself in the shade every time. And all it had to do was turn around and, oh, you know, out the door and free, but oh, it's going to go this way. And changing my consciousness with the fly and being sick and having time, I had this sense of an eternal entrapment of ignorance. I just, I was going, come on, fly, you can do it, turn around, go that way. And it wouldn't, you know, just beating its head against the window blind. And I was so, I was just a kid and, I mean, a baby, and yet I was sick. And it was clear that it was the fever that stretched time. And I seemed to be there forever, cheering the fly on and, you know, wanting it to turn around and get out. Um, one of my earliest. So, have you ever had a, a, something like that? And, of course, anybody, not that we're indicating that one should, but anybody who has ever ingested any kind of substance of any kind, probably, uh, I'm sure it was in scientific experiment, perhaps, you know, uh, knows how, you know, you can hear colors, for example, or you can see sounds, elongate and compress, and the distortion of time. And you realize that, quote, normal perception is very fragile. It's a combination of chemicals that give us the sense of continuity and, quote, normalcy. Right? So all it takes is, um, well, let's get right down to it, a cup of coffee. Right? I don't know if you're all, what is your favorite caffeine, caffeinated is it green tea for you? But if you, you know, slug down a double cappuccino, you speed up. Never mind slowing down. You talk faster, we talk faster, you know. So it does, it's something as simple as a cup of coffee can alter that very subtle chemical balance in our bloodstream that we call reality. All right, the bodhisattva has been doing that now by sitting still. But he's sitting still, she's sitting still, based on having all her qing qi shen, her internal three jewels, essence, energy, and spirit. The strangest one is the spirit, the shen. All of those complete and full. right? And furthermore, To get to this place where the bodhisattva, when, let's, I'll swap out for the she, the female pronoun, where the bodhisattva has been meditating. Now, she has been doing this long enough with fullness of her internal, they say, three jewels. Furthermore, she has not been um, extending her. Uh, not been seeking outside for sense stimulation beyond the ordinary, right? If we want to enter a state of samadhi, the stillness where these changes take place, we have to kind of calm stuff down. What will break up and pull us back into duality fastest is lots of highs, and lots of lows, right? Still seeking sensation, okay? Uh, Having a really good fight with your partner, your spouse, your roommate, your significant other. That's a kind of high, I don't know. Sometimes we just want to really let them have it because they deserve it, you know? And we just go with it. And that spike of rage is the kind of thing that will take us out of 
stillness for a week until we, Master Hua would say, till we regather the, the wood of our merit and virtue so we'd have a wood pile and enough fuel for the winter. Uh, just having that kind of indulgence and anger, he says, is the most destructive thing to stillness. So this bodhisattva has been gathering back their essence, energy, and spirit, and has been living a quieter life. A quieter life. I know uh, guys in particular who I met who were great fans of spicy food. Oh, these guys loved jalapeno and sriracha and um, mm, what was what's the in Louisiana? What's the hot sauce we always use? Tabasco. Tabasco. They were great Tabasco. You know, and just love it. if it didn't if it wasn't hot they couldn't taste it. You know, they must have had blisters on their permanent scars on their tongue. Um, and after. Ten days of meditation. Said, How was your, your retreat? Oh, well, you know, strange, funny. I gave up hot sauce. After sitting still, I realized that hot sauce was just, it, it, it changed me too much. I didn't want to have to go find myself after lunch every time. Right? Because you do, you, you, you just, even that much stimulation on the tongue. Not the eyes, not the ears, not the nose, not the body, not the mind, but the tongue. Right? Sending your tongue into orbit can knock you out of samadhi. Same thing with, you know, putting on the headphones and listening to your favorite music. Notice I didn't say loud music. It's the one you like the most. That you, ah, oh, it just puts you into rapture and you have to go find yourself afterwards. You're gone, you know. It can be what? It can be Bach cello suites. Nothing with any percussion in particular. Or it can be death, death metal, you know, whatever, whatever you like. But it's the interaction of the organ with the stimulation of the sound or the sight or the smell or the taste that moves you out. So this bodhisattva has been practicing pulling the highs back and bringing the lows up. So instead of like this, a lifestyle that goes from high to low, it's now kind of hmm, like that, more mellow. And you're kind of quiet, because why? When you sit still, all of that self, true self, that you've gathered back, all that raw material transforms. And you accomplish patience. Right? This is an accomplishment. There's no sign to it. That's the thing. There's no proof, quote, of it to the uh, to ordinary eyes and ears. Big changes in the cultivator. Okay? Uh, and it has a name. This ground is called stability. Uh, back in our Chinglish days, it was called not moving. The ground of not moving. The ground of unmoving. Bu dong, right? Not, bu, not. Okay, not, dong, move. The ground of not move. Right? Not moving. Stability. Stable ground. Stable state. The, the stage of stability. And what? Here's a description. What's this bodhisattva like now in this grade? No longer third grade anymore. It's now the eighth grade. Wei shen heng pu sa nan ke zhi. This is a bodhisattva whose practices run deep. Right? They just, they and these practices have now become identified with each other without any trace of practice. Nan kojir, they're hard to know. Hard to know. In other words, where they go with their meditation, an ordinary meditator can't fathom. Hard to know. Um, so I looked up. I went to our uh, best commentary on this text. That's the commentary by the teacher from the Tang Dynasty, whose name is 
his, his, his name by the, the emperor gave him the name Qingliang Guoshi, Master Clear, National Master Clear and Cool. His name was uh, Cheng Guan. So Cheng is like crystalline. Guan is contemplation. Cheng Guan Huashang. So he's known as Abhatamsaka Bodhisattva. He made a commentary on this entire sutra and he gave it to his disciples and said, what do you think? And they all went, Shrifu, we don't understand it. <laughs> we don't get it. He said, hmm, okay. He wrote a commentary to his commentary. He went back to his desk and started over again. And oh, thank you, Shrifu, that's much helpful. So it's the Hua Yan Su Chao. It's the Sui Shu uh, Chao. So it's a commentary and a subcommentary. He said to this thing, Nan Ke Zhi, I thought, what does it mean to say he's hard to know? It's not, it's not like Shaft. Remember, I've told you about the theme song to Shaft. No one understands him but his baby. Right? He's a mean mother Fletcher, they say. Shaft, who's the man? Shaft. That was very impressive in my turbulent youth. I, we all wanted to be like Shaft. Richard Roundtree, he was the first of the... Uh, black, uh, he started a genre. He was an African-American super spy. Uh, Richard Roundtree, Shaft, S-H-A-F-T. Not recommended. I mean, it's great at the time, but definitely it will disturb your samadhi when you watch it. Shaft comes swinging in through hotel rooms on a rope with his guns blazing. He was a black James Bond, right? And no one understands him but his baby. In other words, <laughs> Shaft doesn't have a lot of insight, right? But his, his girlfriend does. She knows all of, she can tell him, you know. So, okay, these, are, these were our role models back in the 60s and 70s. Shaft. Great theme song. Oh, my goodness. So, anyway, he is like Shaft. He is hard to know, right? Unless you're his baby, then you know what's going on with him. So, what did Master Chung Guan say about Nan Kojir? They said... He is like a grain of sand. No, he's like a grain of wheat in a bushel of wheat. I thought, whoa. That's really revealing. What is it about this bodhisattva? It's not that he is so difficult like Shaft, you know, like a thorny personality. So... Nobody wants to get to know him, and he's so out, he's so like profound, you just know. It's that he's so common. He's as common as a grain of wheat in a bushel of wheat. Okay, right? Just say, suppose you're, let's say, here's another one, a grain of rice in a pot of rice. Okay, think of your last pot of rice. Was it today? We ate rice today at lunch. There was three kinds. There was fried rice, and there was soupy rice, and there was, there was rice in the rice cooker. And you think of all those grains of rice, if you, if you had to find one, you know, the grain of rice you were looking for, they all look alike. Exactly. This bodhisattva has cultivated her personality back to identity with all other personalities. It's not that they are jie chu, that they're remarkable and outstanding. It's that they have gone this way. That's what I think is so helpful. What the Bodhisattva has been doing is cultivating away every trace of individuality, specialness, uniqueness. Why? Because the work that they have to do requires them to be just like you. If they're attached to being unique and special and individual, I, just the way I like it, you know, Budweiser, you know, I like, I'm loving it, you know, this pleases me, this corporate flavor, you know, of the week. It's like another million people around the country, I love it. Wrong. It's, you get rid of every trace of specialness. Because why? In order to teach living beings, you have to go down to the roots and 
merge. You have to engage. You have to find the common denominator of all living beings so that from the roots you can pop up and teach them and be gone again. That's what was going on in the seventh ground. Right? Remember in the seventh ground, the Bodhisattva was what? He was, she was, learning expedient wisdom. How to teach. And at the same time, those, the cultivation that's been going since the Bodhi resolve has been accumulating, accumulating. The samadhi, these deep, deep states, have been accumulating and accumulating. So now in the eighth ground, there's even less of the bodhisattva left. <laughs> They've been scraping it off, ground by ground. There's less of them now. So that when it's time to teach a living being, boom, they know precisely what's going on in that person because they're not different from that person. And, I mean, I'm out of my depth here. I'm surmising, but I'm getting it, you know, by thinking, what could it be like? The bodhisattva state now is this fluid kind of state because they will appear, they have the ability to appear in whatever form is necessary, speaking whatever language is necessary, whatever garments are necessary, whatever kinetic motion is necessary, whatever memories are necessary to get next to you, get your confidence and speak or act, behave in a way that inspires you to change for the better. That's the work. And that's hard. People are complex. We don't trust easily. But that's what the Bodhisattva is doing. right? Like a grain of rice in a rice cooker full of rice. That's why they're hard to know. Says Master Cheng Guan. Beautiful comment. That's key to understanding it's not that to be a bodhisattva you have to get something special, you know. And you see these, these cultivators who tighten themselves into knots so that they can be so good at their cultivation, you know. And it's like, wrong direction. You, know? you don't get there by being special. You get there by being the same going the wrong direction when you make yourself ying ba ba. You know. So, he becomes a bodhisattva. He is hard to know. He makes no discriminations. That's probably better than has no. Makes no discriminations. We should, we'll change that. Furthermore, look at this. Li yi qie xiang, yi qie xiang, yi qie zhi zhuo. Liang wu bian. He leaves behind that's the verb here for three, three items. He leaves every feature behind, every characteristic. You can't tell where the bodhisattva is or who the bodhisattva is. Furthermore, li yi che xiang, all thoughts are gone. Bodhisattva is not their thinking the way we think, not in the same way. He's not in there saying, mm, if I do this, I can get that. Maybe I'll make a bid on that one and the auction ends in 24 hours and I might win on eBay. You know, Got to keep checking. I'll set up an alarm. You know, so it'll tell me when the auction's about. I'll get it. That's a lot of thinking. The marketplace requires us to think like that, right? We have to get in there and struggle if we're going to win the item. Bodhisattva says, there's nothing I need Everything that I need comes to me, and I'm not going to think about it. Furthermore, each hedge all attachments are li, he's let go of. He's gone beyond. She has left behind. All features, characteristics, all thinking, and everything that the Bodhisattva clings to doesn't anymore. How hard. What, what, what would it be, what would it mean to leave every attachment behind? Um, <laughs> uh, I was with Master Hua. Um, this, this is a, one of those stories. You kind of tell it under advisal. It might be easily misinterpreted, but 
I went with Sherfu to Chinatown, New York. New York's Chinatown, right down at the foot of Manhattan. Chinatown is way downtown. And it was to a monastery, one of the, the little temples in Chinatown, uh, where three or four of the, uh, the, the other monks uh, had gathered. And these were the uh, uh, monks from China who had come and start, you know, settle themselves in uh, one-man temples, pretty much. And they were pretty much friends of each other. They knew each other. And they all knew Shurfu, but what they knew about him was the gossip and the, uh, the, the fear, I guess. And when Shurfu was in Hong Kong, he was... Uh, known as an advocate of cultivation. That was what monks were supposed to do, was xiu xin, xiu dao, were supposed to cultivate the way. And, you know, how many men and women were there in robes in China in 1949 when he left? There were millions and millions, millions and millions of, of a population of monastics, right? So all kinds of people were in robes. Those who came out were few and far between, but uh, those and all different backgrounds. You never knew who could make it out. How many of those made it to New York? Fewer still. And there, Master Hua had some Dharma friends among the Sangha in New York who were incredible cultivators, including the monk who wrote out the Abhatamsaka Sutra in his blood twice. Right? Oh my goodness. Talk about ooh, taking an extreme practice. Right. So there were some wonderful cultivators. But there were other monks also who uh, interpreted their life in religion differently. So I was with Master Hua and we were at this temple. And uh, we went in and went. The, the, the dining room was downstairs in the basement of this temple. So now Chinatown has been you know, it's one of the oldest portions of Manhattan, this island. Uh, the history of, of uh, settlement of New York is, is old and rich and there's lots of stories there. So this is one of the, the oldest layers of Manhattan, right? And a very raw basement room where they were eating. And I remember uh, one of the two, two of the monks sitting around the table were uh, unhappy with Master Hua being there. He didn't, didn't want Shurfu to be there because he made them nervous. They, I was trying to interpret. The Chinese was going really fast and uh, Shurfu was a cultivator. And apparently, now I couldn't tell who was who among these monks. I was a brand new, brand new monk. But apparently two of the monks were uh, from the other side of the Sangha, kind of. If you, anybody has read the Stendhal novel called Le Rouge et le Noir, right, the red and the black, you kind of know different. It's about institutionalized religion. Well, two of these monks were, were institution monks, and they took issue with Shurfu. And uh, I remember there was an argument that started really fast and really hot. And... Uh, they, the argument was about cutting off attachments. Our bodhisattva li yi chie right? Leaves all attachments behind. And so uh, Shurfu said, yeah, can you cut it all off? And uh, the monk said, <laughs> cut it all off. What do you mean, cut it all off? And Shurfu reached over and there was a, a, a vegetable knife on the table. And he reached over and he grabbed the knife and he slammed it down on the table. He said, cut it off! Bang! Like that. <laughs> the knife was like that on the table. And these monks turn white, you know. And there was no doubt that he could. That was the feeling. It wasn't that he was threatening their lives, but he was sh just... The Shurfu showed something by doing this. And he said, that's what I mean. You're not af if you can cut it off, you're not afraid of anything, even dying, right now. You know? And 
And he's calling the bluff of these monks who are talking tough. You know, you know how to cut like that, and this knife. Yeah, it was amazing. And 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 he's just the quality of his voice and just his, you know, fearlessness, this courage. They call it shi zihou, right? Wei shuo, the lion's roar. And these monks are just sweating and like, you know, they had met their match, and of course. They weren't about to cut off lunch. They much less could they cut off all their attachments. You know? And anyway, so I just uh, I wish I'd understood more of what they were saying, but it was pretty dramatic. And uh, that's what it means to be able to cut it all off. You know, so all attachments. This monk is able to leave all attachments behind, attachments to birth and death, life itself. Okay, okay. So <laughs> I didn't convey that story very well. I haven't thought of that in a long time. What does it mean to leave attachments behind? Well, I remember that knife sticking in the table. Okay, so boundless and beyond measure. Wu Liang Wu Bian. Boundless and beyond measure. That's this Bodhisattva. And we, you know, when we hear teaching living beings. Okay, the Bodhisattva has a motivation. He wants to teach Jiao Hua Zhongsheng, we say, teach living beings. Um, we think uh, maybe we had a teacher in college and we went to class or maybe we had a, you know, uh, we have an image of a religious teacher. Maybe it's Master Empty Cloud with this long white beard. We think a teacher who says powerful words and we're moved by them, you know, like that. I don't think that's what this means. This Bodhisattva, talking about teaching, he has, for example, overcome cravings in his own body. What's craving? Well, I was just going through... um, at city at at, at uh, Buddha Root Farm at our Oregon retreat, uh, Jin Chuanshu provided me a set of photographs from early days at Gold Mountain Monastery, and we had uh, located these, and he'd gathered some, and we were look one one I think it was Thursday night. Well, folks had gone to the waterfall, Kentucky Falls up in the Oregon woods. We got an early start to the program that night, and we threw a bunch of these um, photos, black and white photos, of the early days at Gold Mountain Monastery. This is 1970, 1971, 72, 73. And seeing those photos put me back into my own experience uh, coming to live in a Buddhist monastery. And seeing the stark conditions of that converted mattress factory on 15th Street and Albion. It's near Valencia. People know the the mission. Uh, The side street was Albion. It's near um, Rainbow Grocery. People know Rainbow Grocery on 16th. We were just down Albion, across from the projects there. And it was a factory. It was a 19... It was a 30s factory, red brick, three stories. And boy, when we got there, it was grim. It was barely, nobody would imagine, habitable, right? Not a place for people to live. But it was converted, and my goodness, sure enough, um, I went in, I I got there in 1972, and just when the... Reconstruction was going strong, and I learned how to be an electrician's apprentice, and I learned masonry. I learned how to mix mud, cement, with lime and water, and how to lay it on with a trowel, and how to tap bricks, and learn trades, you know, because we had to do it ourselves. We did earthquake retrofit, we repainted, and ran all the new electricity, you know. Anyway, um, Seeing that uh, 
the photos, and these were pretty stark black and white, color film, we, we did our own darkroom work. I was also a darkroom technician from high school. So I could develop and print black and white film. There was no color. Something about these black and white photos, I don't think I have any tonight. Maybe we can sort through and show them in, a, in the future. Uh, put me back into that time and reminded me of the, uh, the conditions of getting Buddhism started in, in the West at that time. And the uh, people are pretty resilient and comfort or excess comes gradually. Uh, for example, uh, the, the topic that I started on was craving, right? Talking about craving. How this bodhisattva has left craving behind. And I remember um, I had been living in the life of a graduate student in a studio apartment, a basement studio apartment up on Vermont Street here in Berkeley, just uh, two blocks from the Kensington border and also two blocks from the reservoir up before you go into, uh, into the park. And uh, so I was eating very simply. Mostly I was eating brown rice, steamed vegetables, and uh, not much else. That's all I could cook. And so I was already eating a very simple diet. But when I got to Gold Mountain and committed to living there, Master Hua uh, was not one to waste a penny on his person. And he wanted to teach us about the wasteful habits of America vis-a-vis -vis food. So we went dumpster diving. And this was in San Francisco around the Safeways, pretty much, or the local stores. And who knew Safeway, we learned all these habits, Safeway can't sell spotted bananas, for example, right? As soon as a banana gets a spot on it, they'll, maybe they'll have a, like a day old section, but they don't, they won't sell it past the second spot. What do they do? Dumpster. Dump it. That's, it's just the only cost effective way. Bread, right? Bread that is past a short thing, get dumped. Milk, veggies, any veggie that has any discoloration, for example, green peppers, things like that, can't sell it. They dumped it. And so we, this is before the days of mass homelessness in San Francisco. We would, we kind of knew, we would go and talk to the, the guy who was, you know, the, the produce guy at the Safeway in, in the mission. And when does he, when do they do the, the veggie sorting and the, the, the extra food sorting? And we would go out and stand around the dumpster and wait. And here comes the gurney cart with all this excellent food <laughs> dumping. And we would say, five bucks for all that fruit, the bruised mangoes, you know, and the discolored apples. And you say, yeah, sure, don't tell anybody. You know, we would take, we'd come back with all this. We would intervene. We didn't dive into the dumpster that much. We got ourselves between the gurney and the dumpster. And after a while, there was this friendly rivalry between all the religious groups in the mission district. We were there with the Dawn Horse Commune, and we were there with the Zen Center, and kind of, hey, uh, what are you low on? Well, we're low on bread. Okay, we'll take the milk. You get the bread. Okay. And we would work it out. And, and we ate whatever America wouldn't buy, right? And thrived. Sounds like, oh, we ate dumpster dive. Dumpster dive for food. Sounds horrible, right? No. It was tremendous. And it would, we'd pay five bucks for a trunk full of food. Because why? It was going to be thrown out. So Sherpa said, why, why? You should save America some blessings and use this food. Otherwise, what a shame to simply compost it, right? So we did that for a while. Now, it is now illegal to do that. There's all kinds of, I think at some point, Somebody, uh, somebody 
got some of the food and then got sick and sued Safeway. Right? So it's like, uh-huh. so Safeway is like, hands off the food. You know, we're dumping it. So anyway, but for years, that was how we, we lived and uh, thrived. Not just lived, but thrived. And who would think, you know, craving mm, when your hunger is satisfied it's, it's the sensation is like what it's like filling your car's gas tank the car is not saying hmm i like that chevron better than the shell don't give me that shell stuff. i want the chevron stuff right no it's all 87 octane or 76 octane regular untest un, unleaded if you put high test in, if you put premium fuel in a car that's ready for unleaded, you know, regular, you can mess up your fuel injection. But cars know what? Empty, half full and full. People, once you experience that, experience food as fuel, it's amazing how quickly those cravings go away. So... We were eating just to get full. Food as gasoline. And, you know, I'm skinnier now than I was then. I was, everybody was doing very well on the abundant food that America throws away. And we're mendicant monks. Nobody, the other reality was, nobody was making offerings to feed 15 hungry American 20-year-olds, you know, or 20. There are nobody, there weren't enough Buddhist donors who would say, oh, let's go down and feed the monks. There were, certainly. But it's just in terms of numbers. We have more active donors at the Berkeley Monastery now for five monastics than we had at Gold Mountain for 25 monastics. Because the Mission District of San Francisco is not a Buddhist world then. So Master Hua was giving us an opportunity to still nourish our bodies without buying food, right? Keeping what? The spirit of monasticism, the spirit of the mendicant, right? Alive. So interesting concept. How are we fields of blessings if we go into the safe way with a checkbook, and come out with $100 worth of groceries. You know, uh-uh. we didn't spend money on food that way. We still received what was available. That was the spirit. And that's how I learned the notion of being a field of blessings monk. To this day, it's really rare that we go out to buy something, to buy food. I don't remember the last time. No. Now, mind you, at the Berkeley Monastery, we have tremendously generous lay donors who want to keep the monks in, want to keep us going. They value what we do, so, you know, they, they bring food to the door, which is, that wasn't happening at Gold Mountain. It was too early. This is the 1970s. How many Buddhist families were there in San Francisco who knew that there were these hungry monks down, in, you know, on 15th and Valencia? What about, that's fine today, that thank you, what about tomorrow? What about the next day? And the next day, and the next So we provided for ourselves by finding what was available, in fact, what was being wasted. So interesting, expedient means, right? So in the midst of all this, craving for this food or that food went, kind of went away. No, I can't say that. Ah, we passed the 4th of July um, in Buddha Root Farm, right? That, was, that happened while we were there. And uh, I didn't tell my 4th of July story about craving. Wow, I got to tell that story. So here I am praising us for not for getting rid of craving by having the simple food come in according to what the Safeway threw away. All right, so... I had just made up my mind to move into Gold Mountain Monastery. 
I was 23 years old and uh, had uh, another year to go in my master's degree. But I was writing my, dis- my thesis so I could write it from San Francisco as easily as I could from, from Berkeley. So I made the necessary arrangements and thought, I'll try it out. I'm going to move in to Gold Mountain Monastery. And, oh, the hardest thing to do was to find a home for my two cats, Patrick and Finnegan, the brothers. That was hard. But harder still, unknown to me, was my sweet tooth. And it's very interesting. When you're able to take a quarter out of your pocket and buy a big Hershey bar, no problem. You don't really need a Hershey bar because you can get it any old time. You know, any gas station, 7-Eleven, it's got plenty of Hershey bars. And so you can so you don't think about it. As soon as you don't have any money because you're trying hard to not indulge in, in, in impulse buying, that Hershey bar looks pretty luxurious and wonderful and it sings to you come and taste me i'm delicious you know because you can't and you start no meditating hershey bar those little indentations in the top of the chocolate you know and the way it curves down and how it flakes off in this different colored brown you know and how when you unwrap it the smell hits you know and hershey bar you know, oh, almonds or no almonds? I don't know. What do the almonds taste like? Yeah, you know. Oh, boy, oh, boy. You just become a slave to craving. Okay. So, all right. So, here I was, and it was summer, 4th of July coming up. And I thought, I've got my last $5 bill before I leave home. So, what should I do? Well, put it in the box. Just put it in the box. Don't think about it. The box says, Wei Shan Sui Le. The highest happiness is when you do goodness. Goodness is the highest joy. So, doing goodness is the greatest happiness. I thought, yeah, that's true. Uh, put it back in my pocket. <laughs> Turn around, step outside. Well, you know, that's, once that's gone, it's a long time. <laughs> when you leave, you're going to leave home forever, you know. So, so, you boy. Fourth of July it was a Saturday, and so on Saturdays, uh, Master, we would do the Medicine Buddha Repentance, Yao Shi Chan, in the morning. And then have lunch, and then Shurfu would lecture on Saturday afternoon, right after lunch, and then again in the evening. Two lectures. So between finishing lunch and afternoon lecture, there was a period of time. You could brush your teeth, you could write a letter, you could, you know, uh, walk around, digest your food, and get ready to settle down for the lecture. So I thought, hmm. Down Albion Street and turning right, turning west on 16th Street, there's a cookie store. And it was a cookie store where they sell cookies and baklava. Oh, San Francisco's finest, you know, Greek owner, baklava, but the cookies. And, you know, when you're normal person with money in your pocket, you walk by the cookie store a hundred times, and it's like, uh-huh, you know, and chocolate chip, yeah. And they're getting bigger now, you know, peanut butter, yeah, yeah. Oh, Christmas cookies, huh? you know, who needs them? But when you have five dollars in your pocket and you're about to leave home, you think, uh, oh, that's what I'll do. I'll even get a bunch and get, bring them back for everybody, you know. Oh, that way I can give cookies to every, no going to do it. I'm going to do it. You know, the excuse to go and do it. So I was determined. Okay, great. What time? Oh, I got half an hour before lecture. So I go 
looking left and right, sneak out and go running down Albion Street. Don't want to waste any time in case I decided to eat a couple on the way, the way back, you know. And running, 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 coming down, wow, the fat Lauren closer to 16th Street, and picking up speed, right? Come skidding around the corner, push on the door, bang! Sign, closed for 4th of July. <laughs> see you, see you Monday, you know, locked. And I'm like, I have this screen door printed in my nose, you know, like cross hatch like that. All that craving, right in front of my eyes. I just, I mean, I was considering chewing on the screen just to get see if it was sweet, you know. Oh, what utter frustration. I mean, all of the juices were moving, you know. See you Monday, 4th of July. Uh. So I dragged my sari behind back up Albion Street and started to beat myself up. You're such a wimp. You talk about cultivation. What cultivation? You look at this. Just the thought of cookies is enough to whip you down Albion Street and turn you into a monkey, you know. What a joke. You talk about cultivation. No way in the world you're ever going to leave home successfully, you know. Why don't you take that $5 and drop it in the box like you know you should have done in the first place? Look at you. You're just pushed around by your desires. You're like a marionette on a string, you know. I was really beating myself up and, you know, and just, uh, you know. So I said, okay, okay. I know what I have to do. I'm going to put that $5 in the box. No more sweets. Cold turkey. Right? I'm going to break my addiction to sugar. And I resolved, you know, and so I still had 15 minutes before lecture, right? So I come around and turn, turn back on 15th Street and push the door of Gold Mountain open and bang! Oh, here's a yellow robe, the hat in front of me. It's like Sherfoot standing there. <laughs> Big smile on his face. Cookie? And he hands me two cookies. And it's like, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Truly. It's like, uh, you know. Like, and he said, it's okay. Here. He said, cultivation, not easy, is it? He said. And then turned around and went away. And I'm holding these cookies. And, you know, how did he know? And the kindness of that gesture, you know, was so kind. It was like, it was not a joke. Here, you like cookies. Here, have some cookies. Cultivation is not, it's not easy, you know. And just all of my, you know, first it's the desire that I was helpless in the face of. And second was the reaction to my desire, which was, you know, anger and frustration and beating myself up. Both are wrong. You know, both, both don't help. They're that high and low I was talking about, you know. So, okay. And then the response, which is, yeah, you know, we're trying to do good here. We're trying to understand our minds, to watch our minds work. And meanwhile, cookies are good. The fault is not in the cookie. Right? You could say that about cigarettes. You could say that about meat. You could say that about Louis Vuitton handbags, right? right? The fault is not in the handbag. It's the mind that thinks that happiness is in the getting of the object. But look what happened to me when I couldn't get the object. I was miserable. I was so frustrated. I was like unhappy because I couldn't get what my mind was pushing me and telling me I needed, I needed, I needed. Oh, and then the reaction to that is uh, just displaced desire. And then, It's a cookie. Have a cookie. They're nice. Meanwhile, cultivate. Watch your mind. You know. So, he is limitless and boundless. Imagine. No attachments. All sound hearers and Pracheka Buddhas cannot match him. Okay, what's that about? 
That's really interesting. The, um, here's the Avatamska Sutra, sounding a little bit partisan. If you're, if you're sensitive to interfaith, the way... It's hard not to be now when um, we're in a, a world that seems more and more and more polarized. When you find religions getting along, it's so refreshing and um, encouraging and it reminds you of the goodness and the expansiveness of the human heart when religions don't fight among each other. Right within the body of the Dharma, body of Buddhism, we have partisanship. But is this statement here a statement of that kind of fighting, infighting? No, I don't think so. It's again talking about changes in the body and mind as a response to cultivation. What happens when the Dharma interacts with the human being? That's what it's talking about. And this is a textbook story of the changes that happen when you apply Buddha Dharma to your body and mind. Okay. What does it mean? He's, it's not talking about an ism. It's not talking about a group of people. It's talking about a state of mind. When you get to the state of mind of an arhat that wants to stop cultivating, that feels like it's done, that that's the goal, that state of mind cannot measure up to this bodhisattva on the eighth stage. When you get to the, what is a, uh, by the way, a sound hearer, that's our sheng wen, that's Chinglish, right? We don't have the final translation. It might be shravaka. We might use the Sanskrit, meaning sound hearer. It might be voice hearer, hearing the Buddha's voice. Ting dao fu, the sheng yin, er wu dao. Right? Someone who hears the voice of the Buddha and wakes up, realizes the dao. That's what a sound hearer is. We could also maybe even say arhat, because sound hearers, are, voice hearers, are the early stages of the arhat path. Okay. Uh, there are various translations, but it's the bodhisattva's potential destination that he, she goes beyond. Doesn't stop at. Okay. Pracheka Buddha is the next level. A Pracheka Buddha is another kind of what? Nirvana. This is success. Bijrafo is a successful cultivator meditator, but not to the level of the bodhisattva. Typically, they say an arhat is someone who, the definition is somebody who sees birth and death as an enemy and sees the three realms as a prison. By comparison to the bodhisattva, who sees birth and death as the place, as his office. And the three realms are the, uh, the rooms inside the office. That's where the bodhisattva goes to work. Samsara is the bodhisattva's workplace where he, she returns over and over and over to help beings come out. So that's the arhat. The Pracheka Buddha, they say, also known as a solitary Buddha, Pracheka means solitary, also known as someone who is awakened to conditions. Someone who sees the 12 links, sees how creation happens in a series of linked stages, pulling each other along. That awareness can put you into a nirvana state of which there are many. There's more than one nirvana, which I wasn't aware of until I studied the Avatamsaka. So that's a huge accomplishment. Sound hearer, Pracheka Buddha, both of those are amazing levels of purity and stillness. Way beyond our meditative practices, right? But 
by comparison to the way this bodhisattva has continued to develop, continued to grow, still not there. Still not there. So it says those states can't match this now. The eighth ground bodhisattva is much, much more aware and awake and capable. All of the stuff that we're talking about, expedient wisdom, learning how to teach, sound here as Pracheka Buddhas are going, what's the point? I'm free. I'm beyond pain. Right? Who needs to teach? Okay. Now, look at this. Uh, the Bodhisattva leaves behind all kinds of, this is an interesting translation challenge. Xuan is like, Noise. Zheng is like fighting or contention or argument or dispute. The Bodhisattva no longer engages in contentious debate with other practitioners. And you wonder what's behind that? What is the Buddha pointing to that this Bodhisattva doesn't do anymore? Was there like a climate of contention? Must be must be that at this point there's lots of argument about states or accomplishments or whatever. So that's, that's an interesting point. Why is this Bodhisattva no longer doing Xin, Zheng, arguments, fighting, contention, lo- loud noises? Xin is like hubbub. He's behind, beyond it all now. Interesting. Qi mei shen qian, nirvana happens. That shen qian appears before someone, nah, that's not the way you're trying to say. It just means happens. Nirvana happens here. Not the anuttara samyak sambodhi of the Buddha, but definitely birth and death, that experience of involuntary leaving, done. Okay. Interesting, huh? So, this state is pretty amazing. Now, um, I went ahead and translated. Uh, that's, we have to add to our books. That's it for our books now. We're translating as we go, retranslating. And I went ahead and, uh, today at lunch, I promised that we were going to get to the Buddhas, urging the Bodhisattva to go forward. We haven't. That occurs in the next couple pages. So this week our, um, our manuscript is going to grow because we're going to continue to add pages here. Um, it's an ongoing process. So stay tuned. Don't go away. Stay right where you are. Question from online. service and meditation, which is more important. Um, I, to answer the question, I would have to know um, what you, you know, who is the questioner? Yeah, who asked? Yeah. Jason? Okay. So, what's that? Jensen. Okay, that's Jensen from, from uh, Indonesia. Okay. So, um, you need them both. And I happen to know that Jensen has a lot to do with Tsuji. And uh, Tsuji is known, Tsuji Buddhist uh, Relief Organization, led in, by Master Zheng Yan. Um, they are very, very strong in service. They're, they do it better than anybody. Uh, tremendous efforts by millions of volunteers around the world. And Imagine if they stopped and instead of, you know, uh, showing up um, at Katrina battered New Orleans the way Tsuji did with their vans full of antibiotics and dry blankets. If they said, no, we're actually meditating today. You take care of yourself. Good luck. Right? 
that wouldn't, you think, oh man, okay, sure, that's the Buddhists, they're just seeking nirvana, we're, we're drowning here. They wouldn't do that, that's, they're good at their service. And the result of service is what's called fubal, blessings. Do you get blessings by meditating? Well, you don't burn blessings by meditating, but you get wisdom from meditating. How do you think of the Buddha? We think of the Buddha as greatly wise. Do you think of the Buddha as greatly blessed? Not usually right away, but he is. They say the Buddha is one who is doubly complete. Complete in wisdom and in blessings. So you need them both. But I wouldn't know what to tell Jensen until I watched him practice for a while. You know, maybe you need to do more service. Maybe you need to do more meditation. And... Some people do an entire lifetime or lifetimes of service. And they're not great meditators, but they're always in there, the last one, cleaning up, turning out the light, locking the door, right? Service. Other people, just the service is important, but the sitting is where they are. They're sitting until the bell rings every period, you know. So it depends on you and your circumstance, sometimes you do 10 years of service, then you meditate. What do they say? The bodhisattvas who get, in wa- oh, get awakened, get enlightened first are the ones in the kitchen, often, they say. So, hard to know. But the theory is you need them both. Okay? Take that, Jensen. Um, got a little bit of news here. L.A. neighborhood stunned by sledgehammer attacks on Buddha statue. Quote, we're not going to let this hateful activity win. Deadline is Palms, California, L.A. For many years, the little traffic island at Jasmine Avenue and National Boulevard in Palms was the local dumping site. It was the spot where everybody dumped their couches, beds, washers, and dryers, said Lee, the director of Motor Avenue Improvement Association. That's one thing that happens to dryers there. So. The unwanted furniture and appliances at the median became such a problem, it seemed the city made daily trips to the intersection. I've seen pictures of the intersections, just a residential neighborhood. Right? But there was an island where everybody dumped their stuff. Literally one night, a Buddha statue appeared And nobody knows where it came from, but the community was like, oh, okay, there's a Buddha in town. Here it is at night. It's a a cement Buddha image, right? Slightly smaller than life-size. Pretty much life-size. Sitting in full lotus. The stone statue raised on a large planter prevented people from dumping bulky items at the traffic island. It's unknown whether that was the intent, but neighbors embraced the Buddha, dropping off roses, daisies, and other types of flowers. It really rallied the community. People started taking care of the Buddha, said Lee, the guy. All was peaceful in the Los Angeles neighborhood until one evening last month when a man in a white sedan pulled over, got out, and used a sledgehammer to decapitate the statue. Knock the head off it. Lee, the man, said two people witnessed the incident but were unable to write down a license plate number. So now they got a headless Buddha. He was heard yelling about Al-Qaeda and Muslim extremism and things of that nature, he said. I think this gentleman is a little confused (laughs) and obviously a little violent. It's important we find him, educate him, and help him. The crime left residents stunned, says the article. This is LA Times. We're a very multicultural and eclectic community. There's a big population of Muslims, Christians, Catholics, Jews, so people were just taken aback. Residents responded by leaving more flowers at the statue. At least one person left a large laminated card with a Buddha quote and urged readers to quote, please be kind to the Buddha. City Councilman Paul, whose district includes Palms, visited the damaged Buddha as a show of support for the community. 
So here they have the councilman coming down. It was a deal, a big deal. Uh, Lee said the vandalism was reported to the L.A. Police Department. A senior lead officer for the area could not be reached for comment Tuesday morning. <laughs> Eventually, a new Buddha image was placed at the traffic island. The statue was untouched for a couple of days until last week when the vandal returned. Because the statue's head had been reinforced with a metal bar, rebar, in the head, the man had to make more than one trip to destroy it. He just had to pound it a lot, but didn't get very far, so he returned a night later, and on the third time, he really went to town and bashed in the face, says the quote. A resident printed a picture of the Buddha's face and placed it on the statue. They had a headless Buddha image. Somebody printed a Buddha head and put it on the paper. A resident printed a picture of the Buddha's face and placed it on the statue. The vandal returned a fourth time and nearly decapitated it again. Photos taken over a period of days show the statue's gradual destruction as well as flowers and notes of support for the statue. Lee said there's an effort to raise $5,000 to replace the damaged Buddha, this time with a metal statue that will include a rock garden and video cameras. <laughs> it's the American way. We'll catch that vandal. People are also asked to help rebuild the statue. Those details will be provided on the association's website. Quote, we're not going to let this hateful activity win, said the man. So check out if anybody wants to, if you're online and you want to contribute, Motor Avenue Improvement Association, M-O-T-O-R, Motor Avenue Improvement Association. And uh, this is the, uh, check out LA Times. The byline is Ruben, R-U-B-E-N, point Ruben dot Vivas, V-I-V-E-S, at latimes.com. So if you look for that byline, R-U-B-E-N dot V-I-V-E-S at LA Times. How about that, by golly? Four times somebody has to come to... Yeah, but they'll, they'll catch him on video camera now. So, In the end, the Buddha image will still be there. All right, uh, let's transfer the merit now. And I would like to show people some f more photos from our trip to Oregon that I think you'll enjoy. So on the back of your song book, this guy, you've got Dedication of Merit, last song. This uh, song sounds better and better every time we do it. Having People sing. Singing along, singing together, is this wonderful activity. The humans do. There's a human activity, choral singing. Birds do it too, but it's not the same. And it's a song, but more importantly, it's the thoughts behind the song is that wish to do giving with the mind. Um, might mention before we start that um, uh, Guo Mama, one of our elder uh, members of our community, passed away and uh, Master Jinho was there this afternoon, reported that um, that the friends and family from our community uh, recited for eight hours before and while the body was in state, and uh, the now the uh, body has gone to the mortuary, and uh, they're still chanting. So. What a wonderful thing 
if you're, uh, you know, if you're an advocate, adherent, if you're an adherent, if you practice the Pure Land, to have uh, Dharma friends recite for you all day, it's quite a blessing. And her face uh, after the chanting was very placid, very calm, very composed. So, good thing. But we can definitely transfer merit on her behalf. talking about craving for things like cookies and baklava and other things. Could uh, people, if you please, turn to um, 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 page 10. Page 10. And it's also in C. This is from the Dhammapada. This is said to be, by the Theravada tradition, the, the first thing the Buddha said after enlightenment, by the Pali tradition. Um, Mahayana has a different version of the Buddha's first words upon awakening, but in the Pali tradition, this is what the Buddha said first. And craving, um, he, you could just s supply the word desire, and it'd be the same. Desire is what makes the world go round. Is another translation of craving is the builder of this house. The house is my life, my body, and the world. And the Buddha's awareness was that it's this desire to go out of your sense gates and mingle with the dust that causes all the problems. That's where the pain and ultimately birth and death come from. So when craving comes to an end, you've put an end to birth and death. You've become an arhat. And the house builder is desire. So that's, that's the idea. Craving is the builder of this house. Craving is the builder of this house. Through many a rebirth in some sorrow wandering I sought but did not find The builder of this house 
How painful, how sorrowful to be born again and again. Craving is the builder of this house. Craving is the builder of this house. Oh, house builder, see you at last. You will build no house anymore your rich pole shatters your rafters all fall down my mind realizes the unborn and craving comes craving comes Craving comes to an end. Craving is the builder of this house. Craving is the builder of this house. Was that the Buddha's initial statement beneath the Bodhi tree? That's what they say. Because that's the words of liberation from putting an end to desire. Pretty powerful. Okay, so if you give me one second, Jerry and I will bring the screen down, turn the projector on, fire up the, the slides, and we'll take a look at Buddha Root Farm. Some of these we have seen, others not yet. This is our annual trip to coastal Oregon and we have a number of acres there on the Smith River, and it's a marvelous place to cultivate. Are you going to work for me? Let's see here. Nope, didn't work works with slideshows, but not this slideshow. Okay, so Buddha Root Farm, BRF, Fogundi, puppets. What's that? Oh, maybe. Okay, oh, look at that. Let's try that, Let's see if that works. Let's see. Okay. Happy faces, puppets are magic, you know. Slide show, okay. Okay, 
can we do? There we go. Okay. People watching the slideshow. <laughs> watching the, the puppet show. Ah, happy faces. No use crying over spilt milk. What happened here? A mole. I wish I was a mole in the ground. Look at the uh, Golden Gate Bridge done in chocolate chips. By golly. Okay. This is a discussion meeting of the staff. This is the, the folks who went up the first week to prepare for the 85 campers. Sunning all the cushions and the sandals. Tents, tent living. Breaking out all the meditation cushions. Timber. Yoga mats. Who's, do we know whose photos these are? They're yours, Jin Hosher. Okay, great. Tired. The end of a hard day of work. Boy, can't even keep his eyes open. Uh, yeah. Work to be done. Puppet. Mmm. Barbecue. Really tired. Playing the Gu Qin. People know what the Gu Qin is? This is Gu Qin practice. This is Stacy's dedicated Gu Qin player. Ooh. Yummy. Uh huh. <laughs> yep. Rest stop. This is lunch. Uh, near Weed, California. This, we had a bus. We went on a bus from Berkeley Monastery. Arriving, Poodaroo Farm. Welcome. Elk along the road. Wowee. I believe these are fabs, right? Yes. This is the Smith River close to the coast. Remarkably full this year after all the rain we had. Serene. Here are the campers and the puppet has a t-shirt on, I see. And this is the working crew. This is our, our road that we walk every day up and down, up and down. Anybody name that flower? Anybody know? Foxglove, Fox also known as digitalis. This is a major medical, medical plant. Here's our faithful translator. This is my preparing translation. This is Jerry, who up there, as down here, hard at work getting us connected. Tai Chi practice after sitting for hours in the in the classroom, we come out and move our bodies. These are falafel. What what? Falafel. falafel. Chef Trevor. Nice photo. Whose are these? Are these yours? These are Jerry's photos. Portraits. Huali. Tao. Spike. Pin. This is the Smith River.
This is called Dharma 101. This is an after lunch activity where people just can ask questions about the basics. And My tent. Tent camping for folks who, for the very first time, slept here. Right? That's their bedroom ceiling. How amazing. Fuzzy cat or pickle. This is the Chan Hall where we spend most of our days. Walking up and down. It's about uh, three quarters of a mile from the Chan Hall down to the dining room. This is looking down into the creek at a salamander. The moon. Back here. Many hands, light work. This is the uh, or access road. That's called a half can because it looks like a can cut in half. It's like a tin can. It's called a Quonset hut, right? People know from World War II what a Quonset hut is. You can put an airplane in there. It's an airplane hangar designed to be quickly erected and, and weatherproof. Locke is providing medical relief. Uh, Huang, Huang Lan's mother came all the way from China to be with her daughter. And uh, this is Huang Lan. That's the mom. She told her responses. Uh, having been raised as a red guard during the Cultural Revolution, she thought that Buddhism was completely superstitious and xie jiao, mi xin. And uh, having been part of the work of uh, the week, she's watched the effect on her daughter and realized that there's much more to it than what she knew by reputation during the Cultural Revolution. Lunchtime, boy oh boy. Feeding 85 people. Hmm. Big, big walks. Veggie dogs. T-shirts. Uh, what are they? This is um, root beer floats day. Lots of attention on the ice cream. Look at those eyes. Dum. New sink. Playing the guqin. This is the um, fruit and soup table. The women's tape food table is here, the men's table is over there, so we don't bang into each other, and you don't have to wait so long when it was one long table. Sunrise, moonrise. Right. 
Turtle Mountain. Beautiful photos. Okay, I think we'll, I think the rest of these we've probably seen in our, we had a uh, movie last week, we added music to it. Oh, we didn't get to see Doug, let's take a look at Doug. There's Doug. And our group. Um, after the photo was taken, two nuns from CTDB came. In case people look at this and says, wow, what a bunch of macho misog misogynist types. Not a single bhikshuni. Well, they, they arrive later, after the photo. So. All right. Um, having seen these again, does anybody want to make a, anybody want to add a comment or uh, a reflection? Anybody who was either there or people who were just seeing the, the slides? They did, huh? Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, that's a good answer. Yeah. They uh Mai says that the kids asked uh having heard about the patriarchs of Buddhism, who's the new patriarch? Who's the next patriarch? And Mai's answer was uh whoever you like to listen to, whoever 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 is your favorite teacher for you can be the sixth patriarch. Jin Chuan, yeah, I guess you've got the got the job. My deepest sympathy. <laughs> Watch your back. Somebody likely to try to kill you. Patriarchs get lots of assassination attempts. So, yeah, please. Yes, my. Hold on one second while we wait for that. Remember when we used to s s put the screen up and everybody had to move and we wheeled the projector in? This is such an improvement, my goodness. It used to be very analog, now it's automated. It's a long way up, isn't it? We are grateful. Okay, Mai, what was your comment? Uh. Oh. Okay. Okay. So there are, uh, there's one in particular at the uh, Vedanta retreat at Olima where Master Hua spoke about wisdom. And I was able to translate. Um, there's that one, and I think there's one more. But um, that's actually available on YouTube. Uh. Yeah, that's a good one. No, sorry, there aren't, aren't any. That's pretty much it. There, why? Because it wasn't like now, where you just go, oh, let's see, video. Mm. No such thing back then. You had, if you had a camera, Kai, you didn't have, back in 93, did you have a movie camera in 93? Not so much. Yeah. Because when we were doing our pilgrimage in like 77, 78, 79, it's a moving thing. 
if there had been movie cameras, people definitely would have filmed the monks bowing along because we were pretty weird looking, you know. Let's capture that. There weren't any. I don't think we saw a movie camera the whole time. They didn't exist. You know, it was like Super 8 or you had to get a, you know, slap in the film and crank it up and nobody had them. So it's not like that. Sorry. We have lots of Sherpu video, uh, audio, but not video. Okay, more, any more comments on those slides that we saw or the experience? We digested it for a week now. Not? Okay, Jin Chuan Shi, do you want to talk about our, uh, what's going on here? Do we have the mic out? Hello, hello, okay. I think this might be on the same mic as yours. That's probably why. Okay, so um, we have our regular schedule still. So I believe on, um, let me see, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we have the East Bay Insight Meditation Group coming here to give their class at 7.30. And then Saturday, we have our regular sutra lecture. Um, but other than that, is there Mr. Yap or we know is there the nuns or the uh, or the the kind of the other Buddhist groups coming at all this next week? Mm -mm. No, I don't think so. So just those two events, just Thursday and Saturday. Sundays or summer schedule. Yeah, we're on the summer schedule, which is lots of people are traveling, so we reduce our regular school semester schedule. Come back in September if you want something going on every night. Yes, sir. Roberto. Uh, wow. Okay. Third Sunday? Third there Sunday. You go. Uh, yes. Okay. So, so third Sunday, then the nuns from Aloka Bihara come, coming at 5 p.m., right, for the tea time, and then afterwards they give a Dharma talk. I'm glad you reminded yeah. us, otherwise we would have missed that. So once a month, the nuns from Aloka Vihara, which is in the foothills of the Sierras now, come to the monastery. So five o'clock for tea, and then after the chanting, they do an evening program. Okay. Hold on, Jerry, one second. So far, on so far online, Cynthia says she enjoyed the well-planned activity at Budaru Farm. Morning, evening ceremonies, lectures of purified practice, Dharma 101, exercises, as well as the small group sharing. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you for that. All right. So, see you next week for the next installment of our Bodhisattvas trek up the path to the eighth ground and beyond. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Jesus.